I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Ray O'Neill, a psychoanalyst practicing in Dublin. So where would you like to begin? Um, where would I like to begin? <laughs> I always say to clients, it doesn't matter where we begin because we'll always get to to where it needs to go. So it's like, it, it doesn't matter where we start. Um, why psychoanalysis would seem like an obvious question. Um, why psychoanalysis? I suppose I... I like I totally believe from personal and professional and clinical experience, just how, how important therapy is. And sometimes like in Ireland, it's not really like we're full of the gab in Ireland and we love talking, but we're very good at empty speech as we call it. And we're not so great at full speech, but yet we're so hungry for it. And I always find that interesting with clients. Like I know I had so much resistance myself, when I first went into therapy or especially when I first went into an analysis, I was just like caught in that thing of a power game and I wasn't going to let them get into my head. And, you know, it's ultimately about letting yourself get into your head and being with someone that facilitates. And when that happens for you personally, when that's happened in my clinic with, with clients that I work with, there's something so humbling and privileging about it that it read really, as I get older, it, it becomes more moving to me. Because I work in a private practice, I suppose I have, the, again, the privilege or fortune, I get to choose who I work with, which is, um, and I kind of choose to work with people who choose to work with me. And th- so that, that um, I know it's really, I really, I find it yeah, I just, I'm, I'm really moved I, the, by, by what happens in the clinic. Particularly, say, with Irish men who, for all their charms, and I'm a self, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this as much as someone. There's something incredible about saying something that you've never said to someone before or from my position, hearing something that someone has probably never even let themselves say before. So there's something very you know, for all my clinical training, for all the theory, for all the books, as I get older, there's something in the the human experience that sustains me and that sustains my clinic and that I hope sustains the people I work with much, much more so than the the theory and the knowledge, all of which are important and I couldn't have started without it. But if I'm developing it certainly is around, I suppose, my desire to share that intimacy and to bear witness to that humanity of the work. Because I find it, again, so ironic. Like, here is you and me doing a Skype conversation. You're in Stockholm. I'm in Dublin. We met in the US. And technology has given us this line where I literally feel you're in front of me because I can see you. And yet for all the technological advancements, there's more there's more fear around communication and I'm baffled because I'm that, you know, a little bit older than generation X, let's say I'm baffled still particularly when you're working with younger people in, in their thirties, how anxious they are around real time communication. And in many ways, um, therapeutic work, especially psychoanalytic therapeutic work is so real, so real. And, you know, that's what makes it scary. That's what makes it powerful. That's what makes it unique. Because our relationships with our clients develop for them and for us and for both of us over time. Because it isn't kind of, you know, you know, the, the, the CBT school of six sessions and you're fixed. And I kind of like that. We, we don't fix anyone. You know, we, we, we bear witness and that in this day and age, politically, socially, I think the, the bearing witness is really, really important to what we're doing, particularly in, you know, the upheavals of what's going on around the world. 
you know, it's really important. It's easy to be um, a keyboard warrior, I think is the phrase that they use. And I, you know, I, I don't want to diminish that, but it's not real in the way of turning up and showing up. And so, again, it's like, you know, keeping an online journal and that's a way to be in touch with myself. Yeah, that's great. But sitting down with somebody and, and, and paying, not just money, but in terms of time, putting a value on it for you, <clears throat> excuse me, and for them and committing to it. I, I, again, I suppose in, in this, you know, Paul Verhacke's uh, book, Love in the Time of Loneliness, which is a, I, if anyone wants an introduction to psychoanalysis or so, I think that's a great way in because it's a very real book. And I do think where there is almost an epidemic of loneliness in the Western world. Again, for all our technologies and all our means of communication, I think we're more and in becoming increasingly more isolated. Like dating is a nightmare. You know, I'm conscious we've Valentine's Day coming up um, next this day next week. It is actually, and like in I do some media work here in in Dublin, Ireland, and we were just they want to do a radio show, um, and I was just like, is there any chance rather than doing the stereotypical? Valentine's Day dating and relationships and how to make relationship. Could we just do something around the stigma of being single? You know, and the, the single shaming culture that Valentine's Day absolutely pushes so intrusively. And they were like, you know, I don't know whether they'll go with it, but they were surprised that someone said it. You know, and and, and that's, again, I suppose, because the analytical relationship is a relationship. And for a lot of lonely people or isolated people or people in need of, you know, being recognized and witness, it's become more and more important. And I think your point, too, of like being witness, but also people having to communicate in real time, because like with text messaging, people just communicate when they want to. It's not usually in real time or it's very impulsive and not really a communication. It's just like a reaction to what the other person said. Or a lot of my patients that might be like college age say they don't usually have another 45 minutes or an hour where they just sit and talk to someone and don't look at their phone or their computer ever. Yeah. It, it, there is, like actually, um, even you said that's obvious, but I think that's really important to say because even in our day to day friendships and relationships, you know, we get distracted. The phone rings or the television's on or whereas, you know, in the analytical whatever 50 minutes, it's focused and, and you're you are someone is focused on you and hopefully you're focusing on them. And that's become a rarity. Like it, it does irk me so much, I suppose, the privilege that comes with being able to afford therapeutic work. And so I love in the US, I've really, really enjoy that. I don't know if you know that group in San Francisco, Reflective Spaces, Material Places. Mm. They're, oh, they're a really, really cool group that are very much, it's about analytically informed mental health workers. So it's not all analysts. It's the people who are working around mental health in San Francisco um, who are just curious in sitting down together and just a lot of them are working with providing, you know, low cost access or indeed free access, available access to mental health. And it, it's it's just the opposite of, of what can be a very, very bourgeois, white, upper middle class privileged uh, profession and discourse. And, you know, because everyone needs a chance to speak. Now, I know all of us have to earn money and, and you know, have livelihoods, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's also people to work with and, and everyone wants to be listened to. Yeah, and everyone can benefit from it. Yeah, I think that everyone can benefit. And in some ways, it's that resistance to doing it. I, I don't know anyone who hasn't benefited in some shape, way or form. Like I remember, I always find it interesting. I'd love to write a paper about this, but it's on my list of things Ray would like to write a paper about. I've noticed in the last couple of years that there tends to be kind of a, a, a kind of collective clump of um, an issue that presents itself. So, you know, so particularly say New Year in January, I might take on some new clients because that seems to be a time when people want to start work. 
And I remember a couple of years ago, um, I had three different women come and see me, literally within a four-week period, all of whom were dealing with endometriosis, which was something I had no idea of. But my God, did I learn a lot about women's bodies in a way that I'd never thought I'd learn and certainly hadn't been trained to learn. And just very real thing, not at all that I became an expert or anything like that, but I became, I love learning from my clients. And last year, again, in, in January, four clients came to me, one in their 40s, two in their 50s, one in their 60s, who are virgins. And I remember saying to my supervisor, I was like, God, this is, this is weird, you know, because in Ireland, I would be known for speaking out about sex and, you know, because Ireland still is quite a conservative, shameful culture. And I would be very sex positive and let's talk about these things and let's celebrate pleasure and enjoyment, you know, and not just the facts of life. Let's have the fun of life as well in there. And I said to my supervisor, I said, this is strange. Like of all people to come and, you know, work with me, Mr. Like talking about sex toys, Mr. Talking about orgasms, Mr. Talking about the joys of masturbation, you know. And my supervisor turned around and said, but actually, that's exactly why they can say it to you, because you're not going to judge them. And you're probably the only person who will see them as sexual. Because they're afraid of sharing that with somebody else. And that was it was about the shame of non-sexual experience or lack of sexual experience and the anxiety around how do you even bring this into such a hyper sexualized dating culture which contemporary exists and that that really again i just that shifted something for me i just thought god maybe maybe i am the only person that they will ever be express their sexuality with share that hope that fear that joy that anxiety and it you know that's again i suppose an important encounter and, and something the psychoanalytic space opens because it's not about, you know, being a, a whatever, a 53 year old virgin. There's, that's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is something that, you know, someone can share, someone can have again, using the word we used earlier, witnessed. And so there being less stigma around that. And that's, I think, <clears throat> One of the reasons I got into mental health is is because I was aware of stigma. You know, being a, a gay man growing up in, you know, 70s and 80s Ireland when homosexuality was illegal, you know, it wasn't uh, a great time. And so, so homosexuality, because that was the only word, we never talked about LGBT or gayness. There was nothing gay or happy about being same sex attracted in those days. The two discourses I had was a very religious discourse of sin or a very medicalized discourse of pathology. And so carrying those, that double stigma of being a gay man and being mentally ill. And I realized that, you know, my mental health struggles weren't about my, me and my sexuality. It was about the world and my sexuality. And mm -hmm. so the problem wasn't just in me, it was around me. And I, again, I like that within psychoanalytic discourse, there is a recognition of the symbolic order, as Lacan would call it, would call it how society functions or doesn't function, how, how mental health difficulties are a social difficulty alongside being a personal one. And there's something about that context that's very liberating. A real and it's a difficult liberation. I'm not trying to idealize it, but um, yeah, that issue of of stigma, I think runs. I think everyone that comes into our clinic is carrying or is holding a stigma around their secret shame, their secret pain, or their secret hurt. No, yeah, that's a great way to put it, and it's absolutely the problem. Uh, in the U.S. as well, it's just like this very Christian mind frame that pathologizes everything, uh, any sort of difference whatsoever from this norm that like, who is this norm? Nobody. So it's, it's like everybody's, everybody's going to have something, you know. 
And this is, again, I suppose, because of social media and because of this kind of I love my favorite quote from last year. Someone's and I can't even remember who said it or where I read it. It was like George Orwell got everything right in 1984, except the fact that we ourselves would be carrying the cameras. And I was just like, because I love 1984. I, I think it's it's my go to book in terms of contemporary culture. And I just thought, yeah, that we didn't realize that literally these phone things would be our own self imprisonment. Mm. And so we live we live so many people and lives in social media in which like what everyone is doing is normal. And we're so, you know, because we're not eating in that exciting restaurant or we're not hanging out with that bunch of friends. And it's a strange world that we're becoming. And I'm sure every generation has had some kind of crises, but it, it's the the level of technological advancement is so rapid, it's really hard to keep up. So potentially I'm becoming a bit more of a Luddite as I get older, <laughs> says he on his laptop talking on Skype with Vanessa. <laughs> and that's it. Like, it's like everything, I suppose, um, just to kind of dig myself out of that hypocritical hole I just built myself. Everything. And this is, again, like a lot of people will come into the clinic and they'll like, am I good? Am I bad? And the world is much more complex. Technology is neither good nor bad. It's how we interact with it, how we use it or how we get used by it that decides. Like The objects themselves aren't good or bad. It's our relationship to the objects that are either productive or unproductive or what it is they're producing is what we should be examining rather than some kind of ethical and again that comes back to sex is you know sex or drugs are they good are they bad it completely depends on what they're producing or what the desire for their production might be right and it could be some some of each yeah absolutely <laughs> like again you know the, the classic one there's a big thing going on in ireland which again is great measure in 2019 there was a, a a call for for um, for school children, uh, high school kids, as you would say, secondary school kids, as we say here in Ireland, to have education around pornography, because there was research done in in UCG University College Galway that said two thirds of of children by the age of thirteen have seen pornography. Now I always kind of I joke around pornography because when I was you know a teenager, obviously pornography existed, but it was kind of difficult to get. And part of the enjoyment of the pornography was the difficulty to access it. And so, you know, that you manage to find the magazine or the video or whatever and share it amongst your peers or whatever it may be. Whereas now there's and there was the, the important shame of finding pornography. You had to have an encounter with shame. You know, you had to rob it from the news agents or you had to take the fre the video from your dad's collection or your friend's dad's collection or whatever it may be. Whereas now that encounter with shame is taken away because of how accessible pornography is. So again, it's not that pornography is bad per se. It's how accessible it is that's problematic. And so again, going back to what we were saying earlier on, it's like dating culture, it's too easy to swipe left and swipe right. The, the gorgeousness in dating is in that terrifying looking at somebody across the coffee table going, hi, are you Vanessa? <laughs> you know, that's that awkwardness. That's beautiful. That's really, really important. And a lot of these technologies in making our lives easier is removing the terrible beauty, to quote an Irish poet which is really, I think, really, really important. And again, coming back, because I think we're going to keep coming back to analysis. There's a terrible beauty in that real encounter of sitting down face to face and having someone really listen to you. And listen to you in a way that pushes you to listen to yourself. Yeah, I didn't even thought about that when you go 
like to meet somebody from an app or something like that, you've both already agreed that this is something you want to do. So there's like still some awkwardness or nervousness, but there's not, I don't know, something there is definitely lost. Yeah, I kind of, I really do think that. And again, it's, I, I think there's more commodification in terms of how we market ourselves on these dating apps and how we present ourselves in social media because we can control that. And yet the joy of, of being in a relationship with somebody is when they've seen us, you know, with, says he who's bald, you know, having a bad hair day or when they see us without our makeup or without our glamour or without those filters. That's when we know we're really meeting someone. When someone turns around and is excited by us in our most ordinary, our most banal. And again, that's what happens in an analytical relationship. You, you know, the makeup comes off. If it doesn't, it's not going to be an analysis. You know, all the glamour is not stripped away because it's not an analyst's job to remove. It's just, there's that relationship in which something emerges and something uncovers. And I, I always find that funny, you know, people at the beginning of analytical work, you know, because it's the social pressure, you know, wearing makeup and mascara, definitely at a certain point in analytical work, you realize there's no point in wearing mascara when I go to my analyst because it usually ends up on my chin. <laughs> and there, there's something metaphorical about that. What's the practice like in Dublin? What's this kind of analytic scene like? Um, again, like it, I suppose traditionally, again, I think which is the experience of most psychoanalysts that, you know, uh, psychiatry and CBT psychology are still the dominant mental health discourses because of their position within kind of science and knowledge and authority. But there is a kind of a growing emergence of the need to talk like Ireland has a horrifically high rate of uh, suicide, particularly amongst young people. And we also have, you know, one of the highest statistics of childhood sexual abuse. And, you know, there's a recognition that these things, you know, drugs and CBT um, only go so far and that people need to talk about their story. And more importantly, so again, like the, the difference between psychoanalysis and other talking therapies is it's not just ha telling that story, but having that story reframed, challenged, re -engaged. So the story that we tell when we first start analytical work and the story develops and emerges. So there's a lot of repetition. So in analysis, there's no point, sure, I told you that before. Of course, you told it before. But in the retelling, you're going to say something new. We can't but do that. And that's, again, to me, the power. My background originally was um, literature. Like that was, I started off doing a degree in English and history uh, in the arts. And, you know, that's, of course, that led to psychoanalysis because one is about creativity in writing fiction and the other is dream versus the reality that nobody ever learns from history. And so it can't be, it isn't a coincidence that, you know, my original educational framing was in a, a creative historical discourses. And then I move into psychoanalysis as against other, you know, mental health discourses. What was that shift like? How did that happen? It happened really slowly. Um, and it wasn't, again, like there was no conscious intention. Like originally, I kind of, I thought I was going to go into the law and I was going to be a, a barrister. So like a, a lawyer, like you would say, that argues in court and I wanted to work in family law. So there's I can always see elements like, again, as Lacanians, we understand the significance of the law and the family. So even the fact that family law, it's not that much of a shift. Um, but when I started doing my apprenticeship in law, I was so disillusioned. I realized I was too much of an idealist. And that my fantasy of, you know, that the law serves the people, I realized very quickly the law serves the wealthy. And there, there's one system for people who can afford good legal representation and a very different uh, system for people who can't afford. And that I found that too, too much to deal with. 
And so then I, um, I really decided, okay, well, what do I like doing? I love education. I think education is the great potential liberator for allowing people think for themselves, allowing people to be more than themselves. And so I, I moved into third level um, education. I found that really engaging. But again, as with everything, there's politics involved. And at some point, this idea, I really would like to work for myself, that that might give me more freedom or more autonomy or more integrity. And I'd always been working in mental health as a volunteer. And, you know, I, I'd never thought about it as a career, you know, whether it was doing work on phone line or doing work, you know, group work, particularly around LGBT stuff um, in Ireland, which, you know, there were very few out gay men and lesbians in the early 90s, you know, pr promoting and, and supporting and being a positive role model or trying to be a positive role model. And I suppose through all that in my 20s, I um, started an my analytical training just as I was hitting 30. And again, I did that more for the personal than the clinical. Even when I was doing it, I just thought this is interesting. This is engaging. This is challenging. But I, my fantasy or my desire wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be a psychoanalyst. I thought I'm going to be someone who learns something through this experience. But as I went through the experience and, you know, doing clinical settings and, and taking on clinical work, I really, I really enjoyed it. I really, I, I started off working in the prison service, you know, again, as a volunteer as part of, and it was so, it was so humbling. It was so powerful. And again, like it was enough that, you know, my social conscience and my sense of social equality was being met working in a male prison, you know, just so powerful in terms of, I remember having a, an interesting exchange with my then clinical supervisor who kind of um, was arguing with me. She was, you know, because too many psychoanalysts focus on the money as the payment. And so she was saying, how much are these guys in the prison paying? And the, most of the guys that I'd be working with would all be from very, very, lower social economic background, you know, they, they don't have money and they're in prison, so they can't earn money. You know, if they're doing any kind of work in prison, it's kind of for like a dollar a day equivalent. And I was like, they're, they're not paying cash. And they're like, well, then my supervisor dismissed it and said, well, then they're not doing clinical work. And I said, but they are paying because they have five hours outside their cell a day and one of those hours is being given over. They're giving 20% of their freedom, or freedom question mark, of their non-cell time over to this work. And not only that, they pay by walking by all their peers and being belittled by the prison guards, being belittled by other prisoners for going to see the therapist, the counsellor, the shrink. And I suppose that really, there's lots of ways in which we pay to do the work. And if we focus just on the dollar amount or the euro amount, we miss the other ways in which we pay. Because you and I both know there's clients who pay lots of money, but have never paid in truth. So they may be coming for months or years on end and never say anything that actually costs them. And that moment that happens in the in the clinical setting where someone says something that costs them dear. That's valuable. That's like that's a moment that's that makes it worthwhile for me as a clinician. And I hope for the clients as well. And it's nice to know, too, that you worked in these settings that aren't like traditional analytic settings, more with like different communities and inside institutions and that sort of thing. Because I found, I have as well, and I found that that's one of the places where I kind of hit a wall with some analytic colleagues is like, it's too theoretical and I don't see it putting, being put to practice with like more average day-to-day -day people. And that's why I want to try to get it out like through these lectures and podcasts and events and stuff like that to a wider audience when I can. Yeah, I think that's really important because it, it, you know, who can afford to go and see 
an analyst four or five times a week, you know, in the kind of traditional analytical setting. And, you know, so th- like in Ireland, amongst our analytical community, there is a big um, debate slash anxiety because there's always debates when there's anxiety around, you know, do you using telephone work or doing Skype work for the work we're doing? And like, again, I sometimes I will do that work and I'm happy to do that work because for me, it's about access, not convenience. Like if somebody wants to do Skype sessions with me because, you know, really, you know, crossing two miles across town is too exhausting, then that's not someone whose desire to do the work is strong enough. But as I said, because I say part of my work is, again, working with people with terminal illness, they don't have the privilege of having a body that will enable them to travel. And so how do you do how do you do the good work that we can do that provides access? I understand the anxiety around convenience. You know, but again, urban centers obviously will have more analytical community. I'm kind of, I suppose, unique because I, I split my time between working in Dublin, which is the capital city, but also working in rural Ireland, in West Cork, but also in smaller communities where there isn't, you know, the privilege of having therapists or analysts to choose from. And I think that that is, a, I, I think the, you know, that, like I said, it's how do you provide access in terms of money, in terms of affordability, in terms of time that allows other people think analytically, even if they're not going to go into an, an analysis. And that's I love the, the idea of what you're you're doing with these podcasts is, you know, that people kind of go, oh, that analytical discourse, being aware of the unconscious, being aware that there's always layers and levels in our communication is just such a powerful thing to do because you just it's like I always use the movie The Matrix as an example. You know, that that moment in the first movie where Neo wakes up into reality, it's liberating. But what a painful, horrific, traumatic liberation. Like we are living in a hyper real culture and analysis is one of those few places where we literally, I know this is now going to sound like I'm promoting psychiatric drugs, but there's the, you know, the red pill and the blue pill. And which one do you want? Do you want to go and see how deep the rabbit hole goes? And that is a terrifying thing to do. And so I'm constantly humbled when people have the courage to do that. But there, that that's the thing is, I... Like there's a lot of fantasy in, in kind of mental health work that, you know, we, we cure people or that we go to a mental health person to be fixed or to be cured or to use the word that's really important to be normal. Again and again, I love Paul Verhaga's book on being normal and other disorders. The title alone is something we should all carry. We listen to them and we get them to listen to themselves. And it is a painful thing to listen to ourselves. We're, we're really good at talking, you know, and like that is the kind of notion of empty speech. And we're not so good at listening to what we were saying in the stream of consciousness. I remember as a teenager, skiving off school one day and going to see that movie, Dangerous Liaisons, back in, must have been whatever, 87 or 88 or something like that. And, um, uh, I remember that there's that scene where Glenn Close's character um, talks about, you know, um, what do, the line is something like, um, I paid, you know, I stayed silent and I paid attention not to what people were, were saying, which naturally was of no interest at all, but to whatever it was they were trying to hide. And there's something, obviously, I think that line is something similar to that. It stayed with me, that notion of, I suppose, that's a very different story, but the performance, the ego that we all do, and then an awareness that everybody is hiding something. And obviously, that in an analytical session, we're not doing that to manipulate or for dangerously, but maybe psychoanalysis is a dangerous liaison and it is, you know, um, scary. And it should be scary. This again comes back to 
the only date worth going on is the date where you've butterflies in your stomach and not in your stomach where you're worried. If you don't have that anxiety, then why would you go on that date? It's probably not going to be fun. And so, again, we talk a lot about anxiety in contemporary culture as if anxiety is a problem. But again, anxiety isn't a problem. It's our relationship to our anxiety. I think it's really like even this, it's funny, like there's there's a little part of me that's anxious speaking with you now, not not because I know we're putting this into a, a public platform and I have no idea who hears or thinks or interprets. But yet there's a joy in doing it. But there also is an anxiety. And I think psychoan- psychoanalysis is one of the few discourses that honors anxiety, that honors fear, that honors shame, but doesn't try and eliminate it, but doesn't want a life lived in it. We can only be anxious where we desire and we can only desire where we're anxious. And so that we're back to, again, that idea of of the first date. Yeah, I think a lot of, I mean, the educational part of what I do and what we're doing is like, kind of reframing the discourse that's around all of these things and that has been like stated as such a given like when I was in graduate school I have a side D's as a doctorate in psychology and I mean we didn't even read Freud the whole time we read maybe one paper by Freud Morning in Melancholia and that was it Um, and everything was centered around the medical discourse and psychopharmaceuticals and CBT and behavioral therapy and treating autism with those methods and those sort of things, uh, child development, but there wasn't any analytic thinking at all. And it was presented as this is the way it is. There's no other options. Like I found the DSM to be abhorrent when I was in school, but I didn't know that we were allowed to practice without using the DSM. Like that was the rules. Those were the law. You know, so I think even making people realize that there are other options besides this discourse, you know, because so many people don't don't even realize you can be outside of it. And I think for people that are outside of it, either because of gender or sexual orientation or race or class, like it's so easy because we're already not normal. There's something about psychoanalysis, which is a very conservative discourse. I'm not idealizing. But for me, there was a space in psychoanalysis, even though it's it is horrifically racist, privileged, uh, misogynistic and homophobic. There's something about its challenging of what is normal that gave me a space to kind of go, you know, actually, I'm okay. Or what, what I want to be as a human being, as a gay man, as, as a man, as an Irish person, might be okay. And so, look, because if I was stuck in psychiatric discourse or psychology in the DSM, like literally there would be no hope. Because I would just take on or absorb or be in a constant reactive relationship to diagnostic categorizations instead of my own humanity. And I like that. I think psychoanalysis is about asking or f- approaching the asking of a question, you know, who am I? And so psychoanalysis of all the mental health discourses, in my opinion, and obviously I'm completely subjective and biased. So, uh, you know, maybe there's other discourses that I should learn more of and I look forward to learning more of them. But psychoanalysis embraces psyche, the soul. That, that all of us behind our struggles, there's something within our soul or our spirit that is at odds with the world or that the world is at odds with us. And again, that, that's something that other mental health discourses perhaps miss. You know, and psychoanalysis can be just as guilty of that as well. Like, you know, Sometimes sitting in silence with someone who's been, you know, traumatized through sexual assault is a really inhuman behavior. I, I can't understand that personally as a clinician. We, you've got to be, meet the person before you can start analyzing them or subjecting them to silence, which can be very, very traumatizing. 
for people who have had their experiences silenced, like, you know, childhood, um, people who have experienced childhood sexual abuse, usually the history is that is that they couldn't speak about it, either because they were told not to, or they absorbed that silence is necessary. And I don't believe in re-traumatizing people. I think that's enough. And as well, again, as I've got older in my clinic, um, I, I have trusted more about each client decides what sh- what kind of psychoanalyst I am, rather than the theory deciding. And I've been more, and I make lots more mistakes than I've ever made before. But that's where the learnings are for me, and hopefully for both of us in in the analytical setting. And that, it's again, I'm going to keep coming back to dating. I had this client who had a very, very difficult year, like a very difficult year. I think it was she'd come out of a, a broken relationship and then a lot, um, two significant bereavements happened in 2018 for her. And at the beginning of the year, we'd been speaking about, look, you know, after the broken engagement, what would it be like to go on a date in 2018? And then other life intervened, as life always does, and that became an impossibility. But just before this session, before Christmas, she came in and she said, I've got some good news and some bad news for you. And I was like, OK. And she was like, I'm going on a date tomorrow. And she was, uh, I was like, oh, why is that good news and bad news? And she's like, well, I think it's good news because, you know, I said back in January, I'd go on a date and, you know, <laughs> here we are nearly a year on and I'm going to do it. And I was like, well, you know, fair Jews. And I said, but why is it bad news? She was like, I don't know if he's going to turn up. And I said, why do you say that? And she goes, she hadn't used apps and things like this. So she'd met this guy on an app and she said, and I, you know, we confirmed we were going to meet on Wednesday night and in this place. And then I kind of went back onto the app to kind of re-engage and he disappeared. So in other words, she had been blocked, but she, you know, hadn't access to that discourse. And I was like, look, it sounds like you've been blocked you know, but there is, you know, a 0.015% chance that maybe he lost his phone <laughs> or something else happened. And I said, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I'm scared about being stood up, but I'm going to go on the date anyway. And I was like, that's what we do. We go on the date so we don't stand ourselves up. We put ourselves into these scary, anxiety provoking places so that we turn up for ourselves. And that's what we do in this epidemic of loneliness, in this epidemic of alienation. We turn up for ourselves. And that I know I had this personally, and it was a huge intervention. I remember when I was in an analysis for the first time and the analyst said, look, we're going to go to meeting twice, potentially three times a week. And I was just like, fuck, you know, I can't afford this. And I can't do this. And I remember meeting a friend and I was like, God, you know, this analyst person has said, now I must come multiple times a week and I just can't afford it. And why does he want all that money? And why does he want and what does he want? And they just turn and say, well, what do you want? Maybe instead of seeing it as, you know, they're the money that you're paying them, why don't you see it as the money you're buying yourself, the time you're giving yourself? And that shifted it completely. So it became less of the, you know, to use Lacan's language, less of the other's demand and more about my own desire. I turned up for myself. And if an analysis is is going to happen, we turn up for ourselves. I've told patients that before, at the very least, you're setting aside this time for yourself every, every week or multiple times a week. And when else do you do that? Yeah, you know, it's like I said in the, towards the beginning, like there's rarely a 45 minutes or an hour that people have undistracted where they can actually think. Yeah. And be witnessed in that thinking and the speaking of the thoughts again, because it's it's like everyone says, you know, oh, you know, why do a yoga class? I can just watch it on YouTube and do it. But we don't. When we make a commitment, because it is a relationship. When we make a commitment to time for ourselves in a location, be that temporal and or geographic, we turn up for ourselves and someone is there to witness us turning up for ourselves. 
And that that's happening less and less in life. Yeah, which makes that space more and more valuable. Absolutely. More and more valuable and more and more precious and unique. And so, again, like that's these encounters with with analytical discourse away from just its theoretical framework, the actual reality of sitting with someone and being witnessed, not assessed, not diagnosed, not comforted, which may sound like an odd thing to say, but being witnessed, if there's comfort or reassurance, it comes with someone sitting with you. And so I love that line in um, Toni Morrison's Beloved at the end, where uh, Paul D lays his story next to hers. It's like it, just really at the end of the book, like a very a powerful book about trauma. Uh, really, I, it's such an amazing book about how do we deal with the trauma of the past, not just in a personal individual capacity, but also in a transgenerational capacity. And, and that being an Irishman, that really interests me because we Irish people are we have too much history. You know, the, James Joyce's quote, history is a nightmare from which we cannot escape. And again, psychoanalytic discourse has an ear to the transgenerational aspects. Like the cliche of psychoanalysis, so tell me about your parents, isn't about your parents as individuals. It's about the history, the desire the anxiety, the discourses we were born into. And then if we go back to grandparents and great grandparents, we see something being passed on, handed on across history. And that's, again, where I think psychoanalysis can be a very politically liberating discourse around, you know, that that history leaves its impact. And so that's something that really, really interest me. And that's, um, I don't know how I'm, I, I know I've written academically a little bit about this and I, I would like to write something more about this, but I, I'm not sure if academic writing is the way I want to do it. I don't know. Watch this space. I'll come back to you on it. But certainly again, within Irish history, the trauma of the Great Famine in Ireland, which, you know, 160 years ago, 25% of the population disappeared in five years. And it is, it's so silenced. There's a little more in the last five or 10 years around speaking of the reality. There was a powerful exhibition in um, Dublin Castle last year, and it was the first time I saw written in the, it, it was about artistic representations, the famine over the, the 150 years. But in the kind of blurb as you walked into the exhibition centre, they were talking about the the the, the famine and, and the facts and the figures. Everyone, you know, will talk about, you know, one million die within five years. Another million are forced to emigrate. And just because they emigrated doesn't mean they landed there because those ships were called coffin ships for a reason. That's when my family went to the U.S. In that time. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's... I remember reading in the blurb and they just, you know, the, talking, whatever they talked about, you know, the desperate times and the despair. And for the first time, I saw something that I'd always wondered, feared, noted, like for people, for someone to survive in trauma, there has to be at somebody else's expense. So whether that's about the Holocaust, whether that's about the Irish famine, whether that's the war in Syria, if you survive that, there is a guilt and a shame because you got the bit of bread from somebody else. Or you got the place on the ship from somebody else. Whether you actively had to push them out of the way or kill them for it, or whether you took it out of their hand or whether they handed it to you. And that's that's. Irish people, you know, we, we joke about Catholicism, but the, in, and it's hold on the Irish psyche. Guilt has a huge amount to do with that. You know, and I, so I find it interesting. That psychoanalysis is, you know, it did begin in, in a Jewish discourse in terms of Freud. You know, 
that it would find a place in Ireland, you know, and that is in a way unsurprising to me because the Irish people need to talk, but we're very good at not talking. And yet we produce better writers than we have artists historically. The word, the language became important. And the other aspect for Irishness that is really is the, 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 the trauma of the famine is that the, the experiences couldn't be spoken or heard because the language in which they happened, the Gaelic language, was obliterated. Within a generation, the next generation after the famine only spoke English. And so the, the ones who survived, their stories, the language that they used, couldn't be listened to. And so in, in Gaelic language, we call the, the, the Great Famine on Gertha Moore, which means, literally means the great hunger, but the word Gertha actually means wound. So it is to me this this great wound and every nation, every culture, every social group has their own wound. And that's why for me, when I read Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is about the horrific, traumatic wounds of slavery. And it's too easy to talk about you know, to talk about that was an awful time, is how is that carried? How do all of us carry the histories of all of us? That's exactly where this moment is, I feel like, in history. Clearly, the U.S. is, like, falling to shambles because it needs to reckon with itself. And same thing with all of the places that have been colonized. And, you know, we are connected now through this internet and everyone's able to see what everybody else is doing and everyone is sharing, even if it's on a certain level. Um, But, like, we've never been so aware of the globe and what's happening globally as we are now, you know? So um, the, the the best thing that could happen is that we start reckoning with it and working through it and, and addressing these transgenerational traumas instead of continuing to just suppress them and pretend they didn't happen or not talk about them. And that's why, like, if I may, um, this thing that's been happening, Liam Neeson, the Irish actor, has a new film coming out and he obviously did some interview earlier on the week where he spoke of, you know, a friend of his who had been raped. She identified or he asked her, the racial profile, she said, a black person. Um, And so he spoke about going around black neighborhoods looking for someone to get into a fight with or someone to kill. And and people were like, you know, oh, that's racist. Of course it's racist. I think he fairly much opened up to that. But we have to be politically incorrect and own the political incorrectness. We can't just whitewash, and that's an interesting signifier, We have to say the wrong things and be brave enough to say the wrong things and reckon with the wrong things rather than repressing them or suppressing them or denying them. There's something uncomfortable in the kind of keyboard warriors shutting down of the awful things. If Liam Neeson is racist, then more power to him for identifying that I'm racist, I'm sexist, I'm homophobic. But that's that's where I want to start learning rather than some fantasy that I'm politically correct. Psychoanalysis is not politically correct. And that's its value. Yeah, and there's no way to figure out where your ideas are coming from or, you know, what you think, even if you're not able to articulate it. But this is if we're just going to take on, oh, that's racist, so I shouldn't say. Obviously, you shouldn't say that, and we need to listen to those things. But again, it's that who did we inherit that from? How have we absorbed that that was an okay thing to say or an okay to think or an okay thing to do? Like, it's not about being perfect. It's about being honest. And if we're going to be honest, we're going to say the wrong things. What are you working on now? What am I working on now? At the moment, I'm actually uh, guest editing a journal uh, for psychoanalysis and culture. 
on Ireland. So they, they approached myself and a colleague, Carol Owens, about guest editing uh, a particular um, edition, which will hopefully be out in 2020, that's looking at Ireland. Because Ireland has undergone such absolutely revolutionary change. And mm -hmm. it's, it, we're coming up to the centenary of the revolutions that led to the Irish state being founded and the border uh, from 100 years ago. But the last 20 years have been culturally revolutionary in terms of last year we had the abortion referendum. Mm -hmm. um, th four years ago, we had the same sex marriage referendum, things that were impossible to even contemplate 20 years ago are now happening. And that, so they kind of said, we'd like to do something about Ireland and, and look at that. So that's kind of where my focus is. And like, so I, I hopefully <laughs> watch this space. I'm, I'm writing a chapter within the journal just about the Irish language and how, because language is so important in psych, uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, you know, in terms of our symbolic order and our how we structure things that the that Irish unconscious that that Irish thinking or Irish subjectivity is different because of the legacy of Gaelic language. We speak English differently. And so I'm curious about that. Like for in, in the Gaelic language, we have no words for yes or no, which is why Irish people are so indecisive. <laughs> we literally don't have yes or no in our, you know, linguistic unconscious. That's amazing. And that's very moving to hear that this entire language is a, a completely obliterated. There's, I mean, it's still like it's there. There's a nominal political gesture to it. But in terms of a living language and people living it, um, there's no joy in it. And that's what like one of the most important things that happened around Gaelic language in the last 15 years was the establishment of an Irish TV channel. And that was so I remember watching The Muppets in Gaelic, in our, in our language. So they, you know, did the voices as Irish speaking. And that was, I was like, oh my God, Irish is fun. And that was really, that gave me hope to, to that a language needs to be alive and not a dead language in more than just some kind of linguistic categorization of extinction. It needs to be enlivened. Is there anything else that you want to talk about that we didn't touch upon? Not that I can, at the moment, my focus, like this is probably the first year that I haven't gone to the US. I usually enjoy going to the United. I love working. I always, um, Ireland is, I love being Irish, but we're a nation of begrudgers. <laughs> and so in Ireland, you do something and everyone else will tell you either that they could have done that better or that that thing isn't worth doing. What I love about the United States is that there's an optimism in the United States that is necessary. Sometimes it's a bit naive, sometimes it's a bit hyper real, but it's necessary. And I, I hope the gift that the United States is one of the newer countries in the world is to keep that hope alive. I need that clinically, I need that professionally, I need that personally. And, you know, when history plays itself out and whatever happens in the election in 2020, I, I do believe that America can be great, uh, but America needs to come back into the world. And, you know, because we live in a global world, we live in a community and we need to look after the community as well as ourselves. First in the United States, when I was in 1990, I was 18 years of age and it was liberating. And I still find something, even in these tough times, for me, there's something liberating about the United States. People meet each other differently. And, and actually, and I suppose that I'm not saying necessarily better or worse. There's something about the privilege of li living and working in Ireland and having access to living and working in the United States that has helped me. And I think that's it. The more global we become, the more we see how p different people do different things, the more we can evolve and develop rather than staying stuck. Like with this whole anxiety and um, abjection of kind of refugees, asylum seekers, illegal immigrants, all of us are illegal immigrants if you go back long enough in the history. And the best part of the United States is the melting pot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the you whole know, point. 
Yeah. So how do you honour what's there, but also celebrate what's new? And it's finding that fine balance. That's the trans historical, the trans generational. How do we honour the past, but also live in the present to have a future? How do I pay heed to what my parents and grandparents experienced while also honouring that I can have new or different experiences if I choose? Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a conversation with Dr. Ray O'Neill, an Irish writer and psychoanalyst working in private practice in Dublin, Ireland. For more information, please visit his website, www.machna.ie. That's M-A-C-H-N-A dot I-E or our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. Or my website, drvanessasinclair.net. For six on a bed in a cheap hotel room. The darkness reveals bodily outlines, but no facial features. When we are neither here nor there, everything becomes possible. In between us is conducive to both anonymity and a short circuiting of morals. The eye doesn't cry for what it doesn't see, and in the dark all genitals are grey. The lover is surely someone, but could just as well be anyone. The true power and potential of sexuality and sex open up at the very moment union is initiated. This is a central incentive for travel, as it is for life in general, and everyone knows it, just not consciously. An upheaval of the known, safe, comfortable, in time and space, contains the inherent but unexpressed desire to fill or be filled 